joining me today on the Capital TV show, uh, Dr. Kanta Ahmed, the Senior Fellow in the Panted Women's Forum, author in the Land of Invisible Women. You are most welcome, Doctor. Pleasure. In your latest article, uh, you described King Charles as Islamophobic. What does this term mean? How it differs from Islamophobia? So Islamophilic is the word. And mm -hmm. that means one who has a love or affinity for um, Islam. And in fact, because I am British, born uh, a British uh, subject, born a British citizen, we've known, of course, Prince Charles for decades And he has had a deep and abiding, abiding interest in Islam. He studied Arabic to be able to understand the Quran in its original language. Um, he's vice patron of uh, one of the first Islamic colleges uh, in the Islamic Academy at Oxford University. He's been extremely involved in Saudi Arabia, understanding its archaeological origins, is very interested in Al-Ullah. Um, there's a very long and deep and sincere interest in Islam that Prince Charles and now King Charles um, has harbored. And I think he does that as a manifestation of his very deeply Christian views. And that is to recognize that there is more than one route to our maker. There is more than one um, book that has been revealed uh, by God. And he has a great sense of engagement and respect mm -hmm. for Muslims all over the world. This is wonderful. You also wrote in your article uh, uh, for The Spectator that your mother, uh, she uh, from an Islamic uh, Indian background, uh, regarded Queen Elizabeth as a Muslim. Uh, how, how is that? Well, I think that in terms of, of course, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was a deeply um, and very uh, sincerely religious Christian woman. But her conduct represents so many of the ideals we as Muslims hold beloved, and that is modesty, always remembering God in every action. Um, she was very self-sacrificing in her sense of duty. She was a tremendous mother and grandmother, as well as leader and monarch. And many of her values of dignity and sincerity and service are the ideals that Islam espouses. And so I think that is what my mother was conveying. My mother was was born in India when mm -hmm. India was part of the British Raj and King George VI was on the throne. And mm -hmm. some of my mother's education, as was my father's education later, was by Christians that were living in British India at the time. So we have always been raised with a very clear mm -hmm. knowledge of Christianity. Even I went to a Christian school Um, in England. So we see more, as the king has said, similarities between religions than we see differences. As a British Muslim, how do you like King Charles to approach the growing community uh, of Muslims in the UK? So I think um, you've, you've made mention that I'm British, I'm also American. There is no question that the Muslim demographic in Europe is changing. And one of the largest populations in Europe of Muslims is in Britain. Um, he is very well um, uh, acquainted with them, very highly regarded. You saw at the coronation, not only Muslim heads of state, including the, the Minister of State for Saudi Arabia present at his coronation, but also British Muslims, recognizing that they're part of British society. And remember that King Charles comes from a family which once governed over the British Empire, which involved enormous numbers of Muslims that were colonized by the British Empire. Mm -hmm. um, so they, he, he, like much of the royal family, is very well acquainted with their traditions and is also recognizing that Muslims make a big contribution to modern day Britain. Many soldiers in the British army will be of Muslim background. Some of the most revered and bravest soldiers in the British armed forces Um, are from the um, Indian subcontinent with uh, uh, Muslim background. So there's a tremendous respect and knowledge of what Muslims are contributing to Britain and what Islam represents. More yeah. than that, this monarch is also very deeply um, knowledgeable about the Middle East region, not just Saudi Arabia, but Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, um, uh, the surrounding region, Egypt, Iraq, Oman. All of these areas are very well known to the monarch. Mm -hmm. You wrote about his visit, King Charles' uh, visit uh, to Saudi Arabia. Do you know any details or information about these visits? 
Only what is publicly reported, uh, uh, because I am not in contact with the uh, uh, palace of uh, the British monarch. Uh, but it's been very well publicly reported, including in the Middle East region, including the Arab news, about uh, the king's uh, previous uh, relationships with the um, uh, late King Abdullah mm-hmm. um, and uh, how he came to give condolences on the passing of King Abdullah. Um, he's well known to travel on private visits to look at what have now become the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we are aware, you you are even aware in his in his own private home at Highgrove, the prince de- uh, commissioned deliberately a special garden to represent all of the plants that are mentioned in the Quran. This is a person of great scholarship and sincere interest. This is not the kind of knowledge one acquires merely because one is being advised by an academic. This is someone who's truly curious mm-hmm. about authentically understanding the Muslim world. So, uh, Doctor, how do you see the relationship between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, and the United States, UK, on the other hand? Uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, the United Arab Emirates, and, Sa- and Saudi Arabia are part of what is known as the Quad, which is a very important diplomatic and security um, uh, organization, or let's say a set of relationships that are important for the regional stability. And the situation between the United States and Saudi Arabia in particular is an 80-year relationship. Britain actually had relations with um, the Saudi kingdom even um, earlier, as I understand it. At the moment, all of those relationships between Western powers, let's say the United States and the United Kingdom, and uh, the Arab partners, Saudi Arabia and UAE, are under some tension. There is particular tension between the U.S. and the UAE after the recent Pentagon leaks that have emerged, which are uh, very damaging to both the U.S. and the United Arab Emirates, though the authenticity is unconfirmed. And I think matters have also been magnified with this tremendously upsetting conflict between Russia and Ukraine Mm -hmm. and the United States demands that um, international countries take sides against Russia and in favor of Ukraine, when many countries, including Saudi Arabia and the UAE, see value in maintaining neutrality, which I think is very important. And then we add the issue that the UAE and Saudi Arabia are also partners with Russia through OPEC. And therefore, we are now in uh, some uncharted territory as Mm -hmm. to how these, these relationships will evolve. I don't see any concern about a breach. If we look at UK, remember the UK is post-Brexit, is very keen to maintain engagement with the Middle East. Britain needs that. And certainly the Middle East needs British technology and British military expertise and other assets that Britain uh, manages so well, including, for instance, the training and advising of um, elite military units. Britain is very good at that. Uh, But All of this reveals the retreat of the United States from the Middle East region is continuing to have effects. Mm -hmm. And the UAE in particular was very shaken when it found itself targeted by Iranian-backed Houthi drone attacks that reached Abu Dhabi. Uh, Those attacks also reached Jeddah near the Formula One circuit. And the response from the United States was tepid to zero, which tells the Arab partners they have to revert to more local and regional diplomacy than they might otherwise have considered. And we're seeing that magnified now as we've seen the astonishing peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran brokered by China. And we now see um, Sudan and the uh, divisions within Sudan trying to reach peace agreements mediated through Saudi Arabia. All of this focus on diplomacy coming to the local region is a reflection on the waning influence particularly of the United States. My last question, doctor, you lived in the in Saudi Arabia for 25 years. So how do you see the vision led by Saudi Crown Prince, uh, Vision 2030? So uh, just to correct you, I lived in Saudi Arabia 25 years ago for two years and um, wrote a book about my experience. I've been fortunate to be able to go back to Saudi Arabia recently as a guest, first of the Muslim World League and then of the Saudi Media Forum. 
And I find it absolutely breathtaking. It's not only the transition. There's a transition in quality of life. Uh, there is a freedom of movement for not only women, but uh, men as well. Uh, there's an openness to the international society that didn't exist when I lived there. But we can now see the impact of a very focused leadership that has really had continuity from when Crown Prince Abdullah was Crown Prince when I lived there, and then he became monarch, followed by King Salman, who continues to rule and now supported by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, of a very unified view that has been absolutely committed to combating extremism, eliminating Muslim Brotherhood Islamist ideology, which is so damaging to Muslims and Muslim youth, and bringing in a respect for pluralism and diminishing um, uh, the essence of sectarianism, which damages only Muslims, while elevating and igniting the economy. We're speaking today when Saudi Aramco has announced staggering first quarter profits of $32 billion. While um, that was uh, promoted or, or mentioned in the uh, Western press as uh, less than the profit the same time last year, Saudi Aramco has exceeded the combined profits of the next five oil majors. Mm -hmm. Even more importantly, there's going to be restructuring of the dividends as to how Saudi Aramco pays that to its shareholders, which is further going to empower the kingdom to fund its extremely ambitious infrastructure and mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. reforms. These are not just, this is not just um, lip service. The reforms are truly about inviting international investment, creating Saudi Arabia to be a remarkable tourist destination for the region, which whenever I stay in Saudi Arabia, I'm meeting um, uh, Arabs from the Gulf region and from further beyond that are coming for a vacation, mm -hmm. investing in education, investing in structures so that international corporations can do business more freely. There's now an Apple a manufacturing hub in um, Saudi Arabia. There are now Chinese drones being manufactured in Saudi Arabia. Aramco has not only reven revenues from crude, but downstream petroleum mm -hmm. derivatives, which are going to be much more influential and a future in sustainable growth mm -hmm. and renewable energy so that Saudi Arabia is set to become not only the Saudi Arabia of oil and petroleum, but also solar power and other energy sources. So yeah. it's it's extremely, extremely exciting to see Vision 2030 being so clearly uh, realized. Okay, how do you see the the Abraham Accords benefits for the region? Uh, the the UAE was uh, the first country with Bahrain, uh, Sudan, and Morocco to sign it. Uh, what gives this uh, agreement to the region, in your opinion? So I think the Abraham Accords are truly a remarkable diplomatic achievement. I was on the South Lawn uh, at the White House when these accords were signed. I had the privilege of seeing not only the United States President Trump, uh, but also the leaders of uh, Bahrain and Israel give speeches in Arabic and Hebrew and, of course, English uh, as this was being um, signed. Uh, so I think it's an extremely hopeful but also very pragmatic solution. I think the Abraham Accords are facing one of their first tests, and that is in the uh, realignment and the very welcome detente, detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is very important. We want less war in the region, not more. And um, uh, while Saudi Arabia is definitely the crown jewel in the future of an Abraham Accords, I think Saudi Arabia will only enter that agreement when there is confidence about the future of the Palestinian people. I do believe the future of the Palestinian people will only be secured through the engagement of all the Gulf partners, which includes the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and other nations. Mm. And in fact, the Peace to Prosperity Plan that was proposed by uh, President Trump and Jared Kushner very much involved economic development and stabilization of mm. the Palestinian people by Gulf partners to the tune of $50 billion. Mm -hmm. So when the region is ready for that, I do think we will see this. And the more such agreements we have as the Abraham Accords, which you mentioned also involve Morocco and Sudan, the more the local countries have to lose in the face of potential conflict. So I very much believe in economic uh, engagement as a strategy to enhance security and deflect from warfare. And I think 
we are going to see how these accords respond now that Saudi Arabia and Iran are at least on speaking terms. Israelis that I've spoken to are worried about that. They feel concerned that somehow this will distance Saudi Arabia, but I disagree. I think Saudi Arabia is showing in its actions how deeply it's concerned that the local region be stabilized. Remember in the November private investment um, fund meeting, it was announced that Saudi Arabia was investing $24 billion into six surrounding neighboring Arab states, including Iraq and Egypt. Gone are the days where Saudi Arabia would just issue billions of dollars in um, aid without any return on investment. Now, Saudi Arabia wants to elevate the whole surrounding region to turn it into a new trading block, a new tourism block, so that it has the stability that keeps war at bay. And I think that's why we're seeing Saudi Arabia trying to help the parties in Sudan quickly come to a peace. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kanta Ahmed. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your time. Hey, Maria Malouf here. Please click to like and subscribe to Maria Malouf TV YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.